Assalamu alaikum. Mr. Moderator, our distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, our friends and, and our enemies. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam rasulullah wa ba'd. In the name of Allah, and may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon his messenger as to what follows. Family and friends, haters and hatets, welcome back to the features. I greet you all with nothing but love and serenity in my heart. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and the blessings of Allah be upon all of you. So before we begin, please like, please share, please subscribe, please hit me up on Patreon. And let's get right into it. <laughs> so like most of you, I was paying close attention to the U.S. elections. And Canadians are highly affected to what goes on in the States. You know, we're like largest border in the world, you know, shared border, lar in America's largest trading uh, partner. So whatever happens in America, we get directly affected. So I was watching closely. And I was actually watching the reactions of the Muslims as well. And, you know, I, I mean, I'm getting older, I'm getting less and less shocked. But I see a lot of Muslims outside book dancing for Biden. And then, wallahi, I see Muslims, okay, singing the praises of Trump. Right? Trump, the Muslim ban Trump, okay? A re uh, separating the children from their parents, Trump. Wallahi, okay? So I'm watching all this unfold. And I was planning on making this video from before, but I said, you know what, now is the time to do it. So what I want to do is I want to explain the history behind uh, the democratic system and the relationship between that and how democracy exploits uh, black bodies and black people in order to shore up white supremacy. And th these elections are absolutely no different like any other election in history okay so here we go so first of all a brief history about democracy itself okay democracy is a very old system out of greece it started approximately 500 years or so uh bc okay and the whole idea behind democracy is uh one man one vote the whole idea behind it is that Every common person is allowed to put their voice into vote into the system. So it's a numbers game. And in Islam, we don't believe in numbers games. We believe in truth and falsehood. And we don't believe the truth is dependent on numbers. Right? The truth is dependent on the truth. And every Muslim should be like that. You should understand, despite pressure outside pressure how many other people you see saying something opposite of what you're saying the truth is not a numbers game in democracy it's a pure numbers game one man one vote so the crackhead has the same equal voice as the uh engineer you understand in a dem democratic system what you have to understand is that numbers can always be manipulated and this is the point of this video to show the history behind using black votes and uh, marginalized communities to show up, show up power uh, in democratic parties and show how black people are manipulated and how Muslims have fallen into this trap to basically say that somehow this democratic system is a legit um just system and it's not it's just not so you guys might recall that i started a series called the slave masters doctrine and the whole point of this series was to show how on a religious level these people tried to prove that black people were not human beings okay and they used religion to do this they used the bible and christianity to do this and to essentially say that these uh, black people were perpetually supposed to be enslaved to white people because they were the cursed seed of of, uh, of Canaan, right? And so on. They had the slave Bible and all kinds of stuff, right? But the whole point is that uh, the psychology at this time, right? Because it's not really about that. You know, there was religious 
racism, there was scientific racism, you know, that came later on with Darwin, you know, with his book, The Origin of Species and the Preservation of, of uh, Favored Races, you know, something to that effect, that's the title, the original title of his book, all right? So essentially what they believed at this time was that black people were not human beings, that's the point. So I want you to understand the psychology of this Right, and then I'm gonna I'm going to get start getting into the details. So, in 1619, the first black people arrived in the states. Okay, there were about 20 of them or so. Right, by 1635, I think it's 1635, uh, the Maryland was formed as a as a colony. Now, at this time, they were all called British colonies. Okay, because Britain is is forming all these colonies all over the place. So, in 1638. Maryland issued its first public edict, and this is very important because of the uh, extremely profound effects it had on black people up until this very day. So essentially what this edict says is that black people will never enjoy the rights, the liberties, the freedoms of white people ever, <laughs> all right? So for the next few decades, around the same time, the European col colonial powers like Britain and whatnot would send letters back to the colonies, right? And saying, look, we didn't send you to these colonies to relax. We sent you to produce the wealth in these colonies so that you can send these resources back to the actual colonizers, right? Great Britain, France, whatever it was, right? And what the col colonies wrote back to Europe was, you know, well, we don't have the abilities to to do this because of the forestry, whatever. We can't clear all these trees and rocks and whatever, clear the snakes and the animals and all that kind of stuff. We can't do that. We don't have the manpower. We don't have the, the resources to do this. So the Europeans, they united and banded together because they saw a need for labor by use of human trafficking. And they remembered that edict back in Maryland and they expanded that edict. So remember the economics behind this essentially caused them to unite in favor of blatant, unconcealed, deliberate white supremacy. By 1664, 1665, all the colonies without exception, right, expanded slave laws from this particular edict. And to say that basically black Africans will provide a subordinated, uncompensated, excluded, non-competitive, non-competitive managed workforce for the personal wealth building and um, the well-being of white society. Bila, what does any of this have to do with democracy and black people and Muslims? I'm getting to that, just bear with me, okay? So 1776, excuse me, rolls around excuse me, and George Washington, he's fighting against the British, he already had started fighting against the British colonial powers at this point. And he wants to unite these 13 British colonies under what we now know as the United States. So the major documents that were drafted at this time were the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And the question came up about representation so the southern states they said look you gotta count our negroes and the northern states are like what they don't count they're they're a chattel they're a property they don't count remember what i said earlier that black people were not even considered human beings and that's why this right here is important because what the south said look so the south said look if you do not count are Negroes, then there's not going to be any union. There's not going to be any United States of America. So they came up with something known as the three fifths compromise. You understand? So when the constitution was drafted initially, all it did was pick up the old public policy, like the, the 1638 Maryland edict against black folk, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that was never meant for black people. Uh, black people were always meant and used to enrich and empower white society only. So they're doing this thing. 
and like I said, black people weren't even considered human beings, but for the sake of the union, okay, there was a compromise, right? It's called the three-fifths compromise. So for every five Negroes, we will count them as three people. You understand? Now they're considered three-fifths of a human being. And remember what I said in the beginning, that democracy is just a numbers game. And that's all this was. It was just a numbers game. And this was the first time in a democratic setting that the numbers of black people were used to prop up white supremacy. So now, because of this three-fifths compromise, the South controls the representation in the United States Senate. And that's why for the first 100 years of uh, the United States, 75 of those years, the power came from the South. I know a lot of you think this is a Republican Democrat thing, and it's, it, no, it's not. Historically, it was a North-South thing. You have to understand the history to know what's happening today. That's why I went through this long spiel so you can understand why uh, black people are actually used to prop up power. It's, it's the only reason why they're used as they're used as pawns and pieces to prop up white supremacy. And it's always been the case in um, democratic societies. So now what happens is the North, they're getting angry, right? Because all the power is coming from the South. And around the time of Abraham Lincoln, now, at this time, there were no Republicans. It was called the, the Whigs Party, right? So you have the Democrats, who are the slave owners in the South, and you have the Whigs Party. And this abolitionist movement is gathering steam. And what the abolition, abolitionist movement does is uh, it basically offers freedom to black slaves. So blacks are moving up to the North now to get freedom and thus they're trying to build their representation. But what happens now is that the Southern states, they want to expand West. And because of their expansion West, they want to get even more slaves and you know have more free labor which is a threat to the North because already they don't have that much power. And this is what what the, uh, the Civil War was all about. It was never about freeing black people. It was about bolstering the power of the new Re Republican Party, okay? What Abraham Lincoln offered the slaves was that he offered them, if you fought in our civil war, we'll give you 40 acres and a mule, we'll give you, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, the right to vote, all this kind of stuff, we'll give you citizenship, all these things offered in the world, <laughs> okay? And the reason why he's offering them that is so that he can bolster the power of the North. That was it. It was never about freeing black people. And how do I know? Because he said it was never about freeing black people. Abraham Lincoln said, and I'm quoting, the paramount object in the struggle is to save the union and it's not to save or destroy slavery. If I could save the union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would do that. What I would do... Uh, about slavery and the colored race, I do because it, I believe it helps save the union. And just to be crystal clear that Abraham Lincoln was a white supremacist looking up for a white supremacy from his own words, he said, I am not, nor have I ever been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. And I am not, nor ever have ever been in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes or of qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. 
And I will say in addition to this, that there is a physical difference between the white and black races, which I believe will forever forbid the two races from living together on terms of social and political equality. So just to be crystal clear, the Emancipation Proclamation was never about black people. It was always about bolstering white supremacy. Okay. Abraham Lincoln promised the slaves the world. He promised them to free them. He promised them 40 acres and a mule. He promised them voting rights and all kinds of stuff. Okay? And that's why blacks fought in the Civil War. So he promised the black people reparations in terms of 40 acres and a mule. Did they get it? Did they get it? So now, Abraham Lincoln gets assassinated and this is the second time again that black people were used in a democratic setting to bolster up white supremacy and from here you're going to see a, the, a habit a pattern because they do the same things today after uh lincoln's assassination there's a period known as reconstruction and this is the most in my opinion, the most important period in terms of black uh, history with regards to democracy. Because during this period, black people did everything right. Everything that you guys, you know, blame us for, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know what I mean? They're like call us out for, why can't you guys do this? Why can't you guys do that? We did it, okay? During this time, after the Civil War, black people voted in about 2,000 political representatives in the South, okay? They started building schools, banks, institutions, uh, because of what you call it, it was illegal for slaves to read. They started building schools and within 12 years, the literacy went, rate for, went from zero in 12 years. Okay, mind you, zero all the way, some numbers say, between um, 48 to 53%. In 12 years, they did this. Okay? Black people were doing this. But again, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. And who was the president now? A man named Andrew Johnson. <laughs> okay? And... Because black people were making so many gains, and this is after the Civil War, what happened? This was the birth of the Ku Klux Klan. And the Ku Klux Klan violently suppressed votes. Now, do you know somebody today who suppressed votes and they know exactly which votes they want to suppress you know anybody like that without any repercussions this person did this do you know anybody like that today it's the same things that they do in, in the past the same thing to do today so anyways <clears throat> this reconstruction period was a period of renaissance in the black community and the only reason why it was stopped was because of the Ku Klux Klan and the backing from people like Andrew Johnson and other presidents after him who uh, essentially uh, made something known as black codes and that's when the Jim Crow era started. So the Jim Crow era is essentially the extension of the Civil War. So what are some of the black codes with regards to voting and democracy at this time for black people, okay? So what they did is that when a black person wanted to vote, they would say that you have to do a literacy, literacy test, okay? And they give these documents, you know, <laughs> these crazy documents for them to read if they couldn't read, and they could just throw out your vote for any reason. They would charge um, black people to, to vote. They would charge them money to vote. Is there not a system today to charge black, black people money to vote today? Is there not a system? To, like right now, we're not talking about 1865 anymore. We're talking about today. 
okay? With the, uh, whatchamacallit, the prison industrial complex where they want you to, to pay the prison back money for your stay in prison before you're allowed to vote. The same thing. They have vagrancy laws, okay? What's a vagrancy law? If you are homeless, you will get thrown in jail, okay? And then from jail, they will rent you out as a slave. Is there not something like this today? Is there not something like this today? 2020. What's the prison industrial complex? What's the 13th Amendment about? Do, do not, does not the civil, uh, the, the prison industrial complex not rent out uh, prisoners as slaves today? What is Kamala Harris all about? What is she famous for? She's famous for extending the stay of prisoners in prison so that they can go and be uh, firefighters in the forest for whatever, $5 a day. Slavery. You thought, you thought, <laughs> anyways. Well, I know a lot of you are shocked now. I know that because a lot of you didn't know this stuff. So especially black people, you need to look up and research uh, reconstruction because you'll be shocked. Yes, there was a time in, in history where black people were not only united, but showing the world that no, we were not an inferior species. And that again was destroyed by white supremacy. You think white supremacy is a joke, it's not. It's the most dangerous ideology on the planet, bar none. Anyways, I want to talk briefly about the Colfax massacre. I'm not going to go into detail about it, but you can look up this as well, because this is another extremely important thing that happened. And once you understand this concept, you're going to understand why the politics are like the, the way that they are concerning black people. So we talked about Reconstruction, how important that was, how it was destroyed by the Ku Klux Klan and the um, ruling white class. And we have black codes preventing black people from weaponry, prevent, preventing black people from ownership of land, even after the Emancipation Proclamation, preventing black people from working for themselves. Black codes essentially said that they must work for white people and, and on and on and on. But and again, we're trying to stick to the context of democracy here. So. The Colfax massacre occurred in Easter Sunday, uh, April 13th, 1873. Okay, it was a, a riot that happened at a, um, a mining plant, right? Okay, but I'm not going to go into details. I just want to go into the, the court ruling, okay? So Justice Samuel Miller upheld a ruling in 1873 that distinguished between national and state citizenship. This is very important, okay? This ruling was used two years later to reverse the perpetrators of the Colfax massacre, which killed approximately 150 black men or so. The murder, the murder prosecutions um, rest with the states alone, thus giving Louisiana the power to exonerate them, okay? To this day, White supremacists use Miller's language to shield lawmakers for carrying out racially motivated laws without using racial language. Now, why is this important? It's extremely important because not only was this ruling uh, expanded throughout the states, but it was expanded throughout the entire planet that you will find European and Western countries that their politics is actually racially motivated, but they hide behind non-racially motivated language. Like for example, they don't say for Muslims, so the Muslims can understand this because this is this phenomenon here, right? Is expanded to Muslims. You, you feel me? Right? It was for blacks only, but now it's expanded to the Muslims. You got me? 
right? So they won't say, uh, for example, a ban on a hijab. What they will say is they'll ban religious headgear. But they're trying to ban hijab. You understand? You understand? They won't say war on Muslims. They say war on terrorism. You feel me? This is where this comes from. It comes from this specific ruling. Because they wanted to give the power of these white, these, these white supremacists to get away with murder. And they always have loopholes behind certain language that they can hide behind in order to get white supremacists uh, away with their crimes, especially against black people. So in the civil rights movement now, when it started, when it started kicking off, what was the dynamic that was going on in, at this time, right? It started in, in the mid fifties, right? Even before the mid fifties it started, but what really kicked it off was Rosa Parks, um, you know, not getting up from her seat. And then Martin Luther King was inspired by this. And then, you know, he basically expanded this, the civil rights movement. But anyway, what was the, what was the dynamic? Now remember, I told you that the dynamics of the politics was always north-south. And even at this time, it was north-south. The Republicans were in the north, and the Democrats, the slave owners, were in the south. And because they saw this massive rise of, of um, people uh, standing up for civil rights, and America, after World War II, was becoming an international player, Right? So now the whole world is watching America because you know they got wealth for free off the off the backs of black folk or whatever. They're very rich. And they're like, well, how how can we handle these black people? They're just uh entering the in industrial revolution and whatnot after World War II and stuff, you know? And so now you have these camps, right? And the, the politics shifted now at this time. This is when you started seeing the politics shift from liberal conservative. It was this time during the civil rights movement. It was never a liberal conservative before that. You understand? It was north-south politics. Democrats in the south, Republicans in the north. So now with the, the rise of the civil rights movement, you know, the Democrats, they're seeing all this going down, right? A lot of people are, are, are fleeing the South to move to the North now, black people, because they're getting murdered all the time from these Southerners, right? Hung up on trees, castrated, you name it. Accused for all kinds of crimes, you know? Killing black people was like a, a sport in itself. So black people are, are just, there's a massive exodus from the South going to the North. And now the civil rights movement is, is kicking off. And black people had a large population at, at those times compared to the general population, right? It's not like now, right? Because there, again, there were laws that are racially motivated, right? To keep the black population down. Remember, democracy is a numbers game. It's a numbers game. That's why they do these things. They try to keep the white numbers high and the black number is low. You feel me? That's what democracy is. Okay? So now, what happens now, the Democrats now, they start taking some liberal stances. Okay? And this causes a huge split and a Democratic uh, Party, okay? A massive, massive split. So much so that the party itself split. You have the Democrats and you have the now defunct Dixiecrats. Well, the Dixiecrats are like the hardcore racist, right? And then you have the Democrats who are basically, they're, coming, they're trying to re-strategize, you know, trying to basically try to keep their own puppet 
you know, black people, token black people, so they can basically control the black people in in um, in uh, the states. So now you have a, a a party shift, okay? Where now the Republicans, remember the Republicans in the North, they, these are the abolitionists, okay? The Republicans start becoming Democrats and the Democrats start becoming Republicans because the Democrats, they were the ones who were, who are um, uh, pushing the civil rights movement. Uh, there's a, a faction of them. Not all of them are accepting at this time, right? But there's a faction of them accepting civil rights. So what did the Democrats do, right? Once again, <laughs> here they come again, offering black people the world, <laughs> okay? <laughs> We'll give you civil rights. We'll give you this. We'll give you that. Integration. All kinds of stuff. And this is why the shift from black people historically voting Republican, they started voting Democrat because of this major shift from Democratic Party rebranding themselves into this liberal party who's all about civil rights and whatnot. So fast forward to... Ronald Reagan, what was his whole platform? His whole platform in the 80s was this war on drugs. Why is this important? Because as you remember, as I mentioned before, Justice Samuel Miller, with his ruling on uh, citizenship between the, the national citizenship and state citizenship, that ruling was essentially shielding racist laws without actually using racist language. This is the same thing. Ronald Reagan knew what he was doing. So he was actually carrying out racist policies without using racist language. War on drugs, the war on drugs was actually a war on black families. And White supremacists, they knew this, they understood this, and they supported him in this because it was actually the Reagan administration who was bringing the drugs into the black communities so that they can mass incarcerate black and brown people. You understand? R Ronald Reagan has always been a white supremacist. When the Black Panthers were bringing out guns and carrying guns under the Second Amendment, it was him who, who made this gun control legislation. It was him who started that because of the Black Panthers. He's always been a white supremacist. But anyway, why is this important? Because when Bill Clinton, the reason why he was able to come into power was because he expanded the prison industrial complex with the three strikes law. You see, he himself as a Democrat in which uh, a large part, I believe it was 90 something percent of black voters voted for Bill Clinton. And who helped him do this uh, mass incarceration uh, bill? None other than Joe Biden, the same person who you find hundreds and thousands of people on the street now booty shaking for, including Muslims, including Muslims. Because you think that Joe Biden and Donald Trump happened in a bubble somewhere and you don't know the history of the West. And black people especially don't know their own history. And everything I'm saying right now, you can find everything I'm saying in two books. The first book is from Dr. Ibram X. Kendi. It's called Stand From the Beginning. And the second book is from Dr. Claude Anderson. It's called um, black labor, white wealth. You'll find everything. I'm just kind of summarizing the democratic process and the history behind democracy and black people and how black people always get used, always get used to prop up white supremacy. The Democratic Party is nothing more than another white supremacist party, just like the Re Republican Party. The only difference is one of them hides their white supremacy and the other one doesn't. That's why Barack Obama, who got, again, 90 something percent of the black vote, can stay in power because of black people for eight years and do absolutely nothing for black people. 
absolutely nothing and gives the world to gays. So much so that you find black people running behind the Black Lives Matter organization fighting for gay rights up until this day. You know, so forget slavery, forget mass incarceration, forget redlining, forget integration, forget uh, Jim Crow, forget and on and on and on, you know, police brutality, you know, fight for the rights of gays. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's a type of mind control, it's a type of manipulation. And again, as I mentioned, democracy is a numbers game. That's why you don't find the Jews. They don't care if it's Democrats or Republicans who's in power. They're going to get what they want because they have power. When you're playing numbers games, numbers can be manipulated with power. And the Jews understand that. And because black people have historically been prevented from any type of power, they don't know what they're doing. They don't even have a clue what they're fighting for. They think fighting for white supremacy is a win. You don't see no Jews running around the streets celebrating Hitler. You don't find no Muslims from Syria running around the streets celebrating Bashar Assad. Why are black people celebrating Joe Biden? It makes no sense. So I wanted to give you this history lesson and I'll I didn't want to go off on a rant but just to give you show you that this that Donald Trump didn't happen in a bubble somewhere he didn't just come out of nowhere no this is your this is the USA this is the West the West is like this not just the West but white supremacy has infected every single country on the planet including the Middle East, especially the Middle East, actually. So, black family, I want to tell you too, as well, that when you find people who try to undermine the struggle of black people, I'm even, I'm sure that most of you, this is the first time you heard this, even as a black, even as a black person, you probably never knew any of this stuff. You know what I mean? And I tried to summarize and make it short for you, so it's, it's, it's easy to digest because I know it's a lot of stuff, right? But when you find people undermining your struggle and undermining your pain, these are not your brothers. You don't have to find vindication from any of these, you know, plants and moles in our community. You don't need vindication from them. You're a Muslim already. You can ask Allah directly. You don't need their, their permission to make any moves for the black community at all. And the ones who are sympathetic to the struggle of black people, those are your brothers. There's not a single cause outside of the black community, especially regarding Muslims, that black people are never at the forefront of. Never. We are always at the forefront of every single cause of every Muslim around the world. If they can't respect your struggle, you need to leave these people alone. No matter how big their numbers are, no matter how popular their platforms are, they don't care about you and you need to understand that. Those are not your brothers. They may be your brothers in Islam, but they're not your Muslim brothers and they will not have your back. Anyways, I came to you, peace. I leave you in peace. I hope this video was informative and I hope I educated you on some stuff. All the stuff is true. You can fact check anything I'm saying, right? And if you want, I can post some links, whatever. If you just ask, I'll, I'll send you some links where to go to. Subhanakallah bihamdik wa shana layya ant wa stuff for kuwa tubi lake. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace and blessings of Allah be upon all of you. Please like, please share, please subscribe, please hit me up on Patreon. Get on board. Oh, the children get on board. Oh, the children get on board. Oh, the children get room for many more. Get on board. Oh, the children get on board. Oh, the children get on board. Get on board. Get on board. Oh, the children get room for many more. The gun train is coming. I hear it just at hand. I hear them car wheels rumbling and a moving through the land. Now get on board. Oh, the children get on board. Oh, the children get on board. Oh, the children get room for many more.